Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the IVF Daddies podcast. I first met Joey Guzman Kuffel and his husband Rob when they were expecting their first daughter, Camila. And whenever I'm in California, I have the immense pleasure of catching up with them and their now second daughter, Galilea. We've become firm friends, and Joey's helped many intended parents to have their families and understand some of the mental health aspects around the family building process. In 2019, Joey started Counseling with Joey, and over the past five years, he's grown it into one of the most prominent groups of licensed therapists specializing in fertility, IVF, and surrogacy counseling. Joey, welcome to the IVF Daddies podcast. Thank you for having me. This is such an honor to be on this podcast with you. I've been following it for some time now, and just you've had such amazing guests on and such amazing information that you're able to get out through this podcast. So I'm thrilled to be here. First things first, I think, Joey, tell us a little bit about you and Rob and your family and how you got into this. Yeah, we didn't always talk about having a family, even though we knew we wanted to have a family, we didn't know how that was possible or not. And in some weird way, when we started to talk about having a family, my sisters were very much volunteering themselves to help us. And that was such a blessing. And, and it was a shock to Rob. He was like, what? And he was like, your sister said that, you know, that, sh that she'll have our baby. And he was a little freaked out at first. But I was like, well, let's look at this because not everybody has this opportunity where not just one sister, but four sisters wanting to help them build their families. And this is a way that we can both be genetically tied to our children. And so we thought about it and without even knowing much, we just started researching to see how we can get this done, how we could build our family. And funny thing is we were at, in an apartment that we were living in and the pipes burst. And our apartment was flooded. And so we had to relocate to a Marriott hotel right out on the waterfront on Harbor Drive in San Diego. And at that hotel, there was a magazine where it highlighted IVF doctors. And on the cover was San Diego Fertility Center. And so I came across this magazine and I started reading through it. And I saw this portrait of them with all of these babies that they helped create. And so I remember taking that magazine from the hotel. I took it with me and I feel guilty about that, but I'm glad that I did because it led me to San Diego Fertility Center and that's where our journey started. And so through their education and helping us navigate how to start, we were able to create embryos with our sister donating her eggs and we created embryos. But then there was a second piece. What do we do now? Like where, the surrogate piece, like where does that, how do we navigate that? And so we kept researching and then we came across men having babies. And in, in the midst of that, you reached out to me to provide me information. And we didn't know each other yet. So at first I was taken aback of, oh, this guy wants to give us just information. Just like But I think what for me was really fascinating was the fact that you had, as you said, not one, but four sisters who were like, hey, how can we help? And one of them became your egg donor. That's correct. And then one of them offered to be a surrogate, right? Yes. So how did that go? It was challenging in the way where I was really worried about what this entailed for them, but also what did it mean for our dynamic and our relationship. And so with my sister who donated her eggs, we sat down with her multiple times. I sat down with her multiple times as well to talk about the expectations around the egg donation and what did that mean for her and what did it mean for us and our relationship and the child that would result from that donation. And so we probably talked about over a hundred times before we got into the actual process because I really wanted to make sure that she was certain. I, and I also wanted to give her any opportunity to be able to say, I don't feel comfortable doing this because I was very mindful of her not feeling emotionally coerced into doing this process for us because I'm her bro her big brother. And for her to say no to me, especially when she knew how much we wanted to have family, I, I, I was very mindful of giving her the space to say no if she did not feel comfortable. 
Um, and I think that's amazing, setting expectations, boundaries, managing the, the process almost, I, I, I would assume, you know, with your background, you were able to navigate that, but it's still pretty, those are brutally real conversations that you have to have, right? Yeah, they're, they're not easy and they're not, I think in a lot of those conversations, I was crying or she, I think, was also crying at some point because it, 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 it goes just beyond wanting to just have a baby. There's serious conversations that need to be had. And, and I don't know if it was because of my background that I was navigating this in this way because I did not know then that this is a, an important piece that people should be looking at. So when I'm counseling patients on, on, on that. But like I said, it, it was very emotional. We came to an, an agreement. We felt comfortable moving forward. I'm so, I, I've been just indebted to, to, to her uh, for donating, you know, her eggs uh, to us to help us build our family. So everything worked out with that piece. And just very quickly, did you sign a legal contract with her? How did that part work? Yeah, so even if you're using a known donor, a family member or a friend, a legal agreement is important and required. You want to understand what you both are agreeing to. And, you know, it's just, it's easier to have a legal agreement in place. It'll make things a lot easier for everyone. And it's very clear what someone can do and someone, someone cannot do. And so in our conversations, we decided on a few things that would be particular to our agreement. For example, when it comes to disposition of excess embryos, uh, one thing that my sister was very clear about is she didn't want us to donate those embryos to other people because she was doing that exclusive donation to us. And so that was something that I understood, that my husband understood, and we respected her wishes with that. And that was definitely in our legal agreement. So then, so you've then created embryos, that part's done. You feel, I'm assuming some form of, wow, great, yeah. now what? Yeah, now what? And so then comes the surrogate piece. And like you said, one of my sisters did offer to, to be a gestational carrier. And it was the only one who could be a gestational carrier because she was the only one in my family who had three children and she was done having children. And she was the candidate for us. And that also deserved a lot of conversation. I think there was conversation for over a year about the possibility of her carrying our child. And she was very willing to do so. And at the time, she was separated from her husband. And so one of my questions to her was, what happens if you get together with him again? Like, how does that affect, like, our process and moving forward? And so she was dismissive of that piece because she didn't feel like she was going to get back together with them at that time. But then she did get back together with him. So good for her. Um, but her husband was not on board with her supporting us in that process. And as we continued to follow up with her, I felt like we were getting like the runaround and she kept saying things that would prevent her from moving forward, but she wouldn't tell us, no, I cannot do this. And right. so one day my husband and I just said, let's just go and have a talk with her. Let's review this, but also let her know if this is not the thing for you, if you cannot support us in this way because you've changed your mind or because it's going to affect your relationship, then it's okay. And so this is where I got to feel or, or, or really experience that emotional coercion type of piece. Like she wasn't able to tell me no. And when we sat together, she was across the table from us. She was crying, but she wasn't able to say no to me. And so then I took it upon myself to say, you know what, sister, thank you for considering this, but it is okay. It is okay. Right. It is okay. And I was disappointed, but at the same time, I was relieved that I didn't want her to feel this pressure to have to do something for me, even though I know from her heart that she really wanted to do it, but the circumstances of her getting back with her husband just didn't allow her for that. And so right. we had to move forward with working with a surrogate that was unknown. And from an agency instead of being yes. a family member. Yes. Right. And I, I guess that must help you with that firsthand experience of 
having a sister offer and go through with it and then having a sister offer and then not being able to go through that must in, almost empower you in your conversations. In my conversations as a therapist? Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. I, I, I draw a lot from my personal experiences, even though I don't force them down people because everybody's situation is different and, I, and my situation is not their situation. But I will, with permission from clients, I will insert some of my personal experiences to give them perspective of what it could be for the other person. Again, when we are going into this process wanting to have a child, it's because probably already thought about it for so long. Maybe we've been through a very difficult journey and, and we're here and all we're thinking about is we just want to have a baby. And sometimes we may not be thinking about what is the experience for the person who's helping us through that process. So you've always got to put yourself in their shoes. I think that empathy sometimes, as you point out, gets lost because you're focused so heavily on what you want and exactly and not and the outcome versus maybe the process. Mm -hmm. um, very quickly, you have mentioned something there that you're a licensed therapist. So in your in 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 the sessions, what is the difference between? A licensed therapist, a mental health provider, a psychologist. What is the difference? A, a, a psychologist and a marriage and family therapist, licensed clinical social worker, et cetera, et cetera. We're, we're all mental health providers. Um, but the difference between a licensed therapist and a psychologist is definitely the amount of schooling that you have. Um, a psychologist requires a doctoral degree, mm -hmm. whereas for a marriage and family therapist or other, another type of licensed uh, therapist, we need a master's degree uh, specializing in mental health and some type of psych psychological work. And so okay, those are the differences. Okay, so it's almost a bit like when the doctors, they have to do their OBGYN and then they go into doing a fellowship, which would be almost like the master's. Do you specialize in family therapy and marriage therapist and things like that? Or is it much broader and then you select into what you're doing? So my program was counseling psychology with an emphasis in marriage and family therapy. So a lot of my training is around relationships and individual therapy, family therapy, couples therapy, a lot of relational work, and also just looking at mental health disorders and, and being able to identify and diagnose and being able to form treatment plans. And so it's, that's the type of schooling that I and training yeah. that I have. Amazing. Do you, in your sessions with parents that are coming on board, does it ever turn into almost like a family counseling, like a marriage therapy counseling session versus talking about children? Or do you, what happens in one of your sessions? Yeah, certainly. First of all, when they first show up, I have to address what the intended parent psychoeducational consultation is about. Because a lot of the times they don't know what to expect, or a lot of times I met with a lot of defensiveness or sometimes anger because they believe that I am going to evaluate them and keep them away from the thing that they want to do, which is building a family. So I start off by addressing the purpose of the psychoeducational consultation, and I do give them a glimpse of what are the things that we're going to be talking about. And I also tell them, I'm not just a therapist, but I'm also a person that identifies with your experience because I've been through it. I've been through two surrogacy journeys. And even as a mental health provider, I still have to sit down with a mental health provider to go over things that we're going to be talking about today with the hope that they can understand that it is a safe place for them to share things with me about what we're going to be talking about. And my hope is that can bring down some of the defensiveness. And I also need to let them know that what the language is for that specific meeting that we're having, because a lot of the times they are sent to us, letting them know that they, they have to see their, it's going to be an evaluation. You have to meet with the psychologist. You have to meet with the mental health provider for an evaluation, an intended parent evaluation. And so when we're meeting with intended parents, we're not doing any psychological testing. We're not really evaluating their mental health. We're, we are educating them on the process of family building through third party. We are providing them with information so they can make 
informed decisions about their family building process. The more information that you have, the better it is for someone to navigate the complexities with the process. I, I will say that for me, even as a therapist, having met with somebody else, it did clarify a lot of things and it debunked a lot of con like misconceptions around the process. It, it was eye-opening. And even when I went through my second journey, having been already in this field, I still learned a lot more. We're trying to help people understand what this journey can be like. Are you prepared for these other things that you're not thinking about? For example, when people are making decisions about a donor, what type of donor are you going to select? What is important for you in, in that process? People focus very much on tall, blue eyes, just the phenotype and, and the genetics as well, but they don't understand that there's different classifications of donors non-identified donors, non-identified donors with open identity release, or even just ident uh, directed identified donors. When people just, come to me, uh, they don't what, know what that is. Yeah, I'm like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're working with, if you're wanting to work with a non-identified donor, that's someone who you would before know as an anonymous donor. It used to be anonymous. It's not now non-identified or I believe it was semi-open, and I think now that can be seen as non-identified with open identity release, which means that they, they may be anonymous, quote-unquote anonymous, for maybe 18 years. And then, then once the child turns 18 years, then that the identity of that donor will be released to the donor-conceived person. And then a directed identified donor, someone like myself who used my sister or use a friend, someone who you know, or it can be someone who you don't know, but their identity is identified. You do have all of the information to be able to access and, and contact them if so. So that's amazing. So you'll talk through some of the potential thought processes on selecting one type of egg donor. Yes. Yeah, so those are some of the things that we discuss so that they can make informed decisions about why are we choosing this type of donor? Because the thing about that too, is that your decisions about choosing a donor will have an effect or impact on your child. And so you really want to think about how is this going to be for our child if we don't have any information on this donor versus having information on this, on the donor. Um, we don't think about that, or a lot of people don't think about that. And sometimes I get intended parents who might say, we selected a, a, an anonymous donor because we were told that's the easiest. And when I start to share the differences and give them information on how this could possibly affect their child, they have that aha moment. Oh, we did not know that. And that is important for us to have considered prior to making that decision. And I think that's really important in informed choice. I'm always about educating. Like when we first met, it was education about the process and the pros and the cons and how does this work? The whole ethos behind this podcast is exactly that. It's education so that people are able to understand, hey, this is going on. What am I supposed to do? And to at least have a picture of the landscape and therefore the choices and options available to them, right? Yes, indeed. So what are some of the other topics that you may cover in one of your sessions? Like I said, so donor selection is one. If I'm working with a same-sex couple, we definitely discuss what their options are regarding doing a potential split cycle when both partners are going to provide their sperm to create embryos. Or if just one of them is, is providing the sperm, what does that mean for them in terms of being the genetic parent, the non-genetic parent? really giving them scenarios to think about in terms of how they may be affected in the future when they do have a child and they realize I'm not the genetic parent. How would that affect you? How would that affect your relationship with your child? How would that affect you in your relationship with your spouse or your partner? We do present a lot of hypothetical scenarios to get you thinking, to get you to become more emotionally prepared for the complexities that might confront you 
that you might be confronted with. We also talk about single embryo transfer versus double embryo transfer and being able to teach them about the risks when you're opting to do a double embryo transfer because it's not just as easy as I just I want to have twins. There's risk in it with that. And here you're a dad of twins and I'm sure you're very much aware of the risks. So educating them on on, on risks for their baby or babies, the surrogate. Also, we talk about surrogate selection. What is important about that piece? And I really dive into the relational aspect because surrogacy is a relational process. And I want to make sure that the intended parents understand that the surrogate is not their employee. They don't own her uterus. Like she is a person and she is helping us out to be able to have a family. She has her own family. So I ask questions that get them to think about what their expectation is around the relationship so that the hope is that when they do proceed in their relationship with the surrogate, that they're mindful of healthy boundaries and open communication and so that it can promote a healthy relationship moving forward. Because um, the surrogates are phenomenal women who are, there's a lot of talk about surrogates who do it for the money, but I don't see that. I see people who are willing to help. I remember my surrogate did it and, and her motivation was the money was going to pay for her, her son's university education, right? So it's not life-changing in that this money is going to set them up for life, but it is life-changing in as much as they have a dream and it's they're helping us to have a dream and we're helping them to have a dream to some point as well, right? Yeah, I think it's like a mutual exchange here. They're helping us out in a huge way and why wouldn't we be able to help them also with their family? I know that it can seem daunting because of how expensive the process is, but it's worth providing them with this type of help with, with the compensation that they receive. There's a lot of inconveniences that they go through with pregnancy, disruption to their family system, all of these things that we may not think about because we're not the ones that are pregnant and going through the actual pregnancy. We're removed in that way. So I think it's very important to to compensate them and to acknowledge them for what they're going through. Yeah. So that actually leads me on to another question. So we've spoken a lot about the intended parent side of things. Do you also get involved with the surrogate side of things? Yes. So my team and I have also engaged in mental health screenings of, of gestational carriers and also gamete donors and people who want to donate any excess embryos. We do participate on a lot of different aspects regarding to third-party reproduction and, and the screening process. Amazing. What, is, what are some of the things that you would talk to the surrogate about? Mm -hmm. Some of the things that we talk to the surrogate about goes back to education. So... I provide information while I'm assessing to see what their thoughts are. Are they emotionally stable? Do they have the adequate support system? What is their motivation for wanting to do surrogacy? What are their expectations around the relationship? What are their thought process and feelings around understanding that they're not going to bring a baby back home for them to care and nurture for? We, I ask a series of questions to get an understanding of what their knowledge is about surrogacy, what the, uh, their knowledge is around the risks associated with surrogacy. Um, and I also provide information around things like, like single embryo transfer versus uh, double embryo transfer. A lot of times I get surrogates who are so willing to do a double embryo transfer. And so then when I start to get into what the risks are specifically with a double embryo transfer because there's always the possibility of embryo splitting and that just opens up their eyes and like, well, we had no idea that could happen. And yeah. so I, I make it my point also to provide enough information for them to be able to have informed consent. And I also drill in the relational aspect because I want to make sure that surrogates are aware that they also have a right to say yes, I want to work with this intended parent, or no, I don't want to work with this intended parent. You don't just get matched with the first intended parent that you meet with just because you feel like you have to. And I have met some surrogates who have had that feeling. I felt like I had to say yes. And so I want to provide them with enough knowledge about the process where they can have autonomy 
and they can utilize their voice because I also want her to have a healthy experience. Yeah. And um, in one of our previous episodes, we've spoken about what the role of the agency is and how part and parcel of what they do is to educate the surrogate, not only on the medical side of things, but to really educate them on what does it mean to be a surrogate? How do you go through the process? But to your point, every time you have a conversation about this, I still find that I do. I walk away with something new that maybe I hadn't thought of or that I'd forgotten about, or there was just, again, putting myself in that other person's shoes to go, huh, and then I have that aha moment that then I can bring out when I'm talking about it. So I think that's really important. And, we, and we've spoken about it a little bit, but a double embryo transfer, for those of you who don't know what it is, is where you're putting in two embryos, distinct embryos, with the intention of having twins. A single embryo transfer is where you're putting in one embryo with the intention of having one baby. So when I was doing this, my children are now 11 and a half, the majority of cases, people would put in two because the success rates weren't as good as they are now. So people would get in two really with the aim of getting one. Mm -hmm. But now people are putting in one because most people want one baby, right? And it's obviously less risky, as you pointed out. And I think for the surrogate to carry twins, that's medically risky. It's a high risk pregnancy, right? Absolutely. Again, there's a lot for an intended parent and a surrogate to consider when they're making that mutual agreement to transfer two embryos at once. The surrogate can be more predisposed to developing gestational illnesses that can complicate the pregnancy. And so what does that mean for her? What does it mean for the development of the babies or if, if the babies are born before time. What does that mean? It, it could be a very emotional, distressing experience, both for the intended parents, for the surrogate and her family, and the babies. It's just it's it's challenging. Now, I will say that I've learned something about a double embryo transfer. And so, when my husband and I did our first journey, again, we didn't know much but our desire was to have more than one child. And because of how expensive the process was, our thought process was, well, let's do a double embryo transfer. We can have twins, we have our two children, and then we're done with the process. We don't have to go through this again. And so that was our line of thought. And we did a double embryo transfer. And we knew that there was a possibility of embryo splitting. But in all honesty, like most intended parents that I interview, I pushed that to the back. I was like, the statistics are really low. It's not going to happen. We'll be okay. We had other friends who had twins. It's, it, it'll be fine. And so we got confirmation that we were pregnant, and that was very exciting. And the numbers were doubling really quickly, very high. And so when we went in for our first ultrasound, our surrogate already knew because I could, I think she had like a, like a, an expression where she already knew something. But when we were on the call, they're like, yeah, so we were pregnant with triplets. And so then everything just starts coming back. The possibility of embryo splitting, the risk, all of the decisions that we talk about. Oh, one thing that I didn't mention earlier about what we talk about in intended parent consultations and, and with the surrogate as well is termination of pregnancy, fetal reduction. All of these things that are hypothetical and you push away, but now they're like right in front of you. It's almost like it's a statistic until it happens to you. And then it's binary. It's almost like when it happens to you, it's either is or it isn't, right? It goes from being that statistic to binary, yes or no. Exactly. Exactly. So we were confronted with the situation and our surrogate was such a champ. She was like, oh, I got this. It'll be good. I can. She really made it easy in the way where. We didn't feel pressure like we had to make a decision, but we knew we had to talk about making a decision. And while a couple of weeks were passing by and I kept talking to my husband, what do we do? What does this mean? I know that we wanted to have more than one child, but we were thinking two and now there's three and how are we going to handle this? And what if there's complications? It was just very distressing. And yeah. My husband and I have different ways of processing things. That's another thing you want to think about when you're in your relationship is you may not be processing the shock or 
the emotions in the same way, and that can cause tension in a relationship. And so I definitely had tension with my husband because I was very like emotional and he was not, and and I was perceiving him to be a certain way there. And, and so that was challenging. But at the end of it all, at week, I believe it was week eight, the one of the identical twins, the one that split, did not continue growing after week eight. And so they passed away. Yeah, that was hard. I just rethinking, I just lost my breath there. Um, yeah. And then at week 11, the other baby passed away. And so that was hard. And it was hard to accept that, that they were there and then they weren't. And then all of a sudden there's this big rush of sadness and grief there. And then there's also worry uh, and, and just feeling fear for, is the other baby not going to make it? And then feeling excitement because the baby is doing well, but then feeling guilty because we're happy. And then, but we lost these other two beings. And that in itself was not easy. It was not easy also because at that time, we really weren't telling anyone. And so I didn't have an outlet to really to talk right. about it. And it is important to have a support system. It is important for you to be able to express yourself and to have your people there because you need people to help you with this. But in that moment, I wasn't a therapist. I was an intended parent. And I had a hard time navigating that. And so slowly but surely, I, I was able to process things. And I remember being in a parking lot and I called my best friend, I, I, I felt, okay, I can't keep this in anymore. And so I just let it out and I was like bawling and just like, just letting it all out. All of those weeks that I had all that pent up, I let it out and it was good that I did. And we were able to move forward. And so when I meet with intended parents who are talking about a double embryo transfer, I want them to understand that it's not just, you're going to have twins. Maybe you do, and that's the hope and, and, and great. And, and, but you should consider all these other things as well. Like the possibility of what if only one of them is successful in matching onto the uterine wall and you thought you both were going to be the genetic parents, but what happens if they both latch on and one splits and then you have a situation that is complicated? I, I you nearly made me cry. That, oh, mate, that must have been so tough. I'm really, I'm sorry that you went through that. Um, yeah. And that you didn't really have that support system around you. I think that, I know you and Rob are amazing and I know that you have an amazing relationship, but to know that at that moment in time probably felt very alone. But I think that also informs a lot of that empathy that you have for other people to bring that landscape thing again to what you're saying, you're putting in one or two, this could happen. That's huge. And this is my experience is the motivation for me to have transitioned from practicing in mental health treatment centers to, to working in third party that, and of course, Dr. Park, <laughs> Dr. Park was such an advocate for me to, to work in third party, to help people who struggle with things that were similar to mine, having the educational background with psychology that I do. And so she really was also such an integral part of me taking that leap and, and switching over. And I'm, I'm glad that I did. And I, I also tell my husband all the time, I'm, I'm so blessed and I'm so thankful for our experience as painful as it was, because now I get to do something that I really love. And so I always thank my daughter too, because I say, because of you, I was able to, to do this now. And it has afforded me just a lot of flexibility as well to be able to watch my daughter grow. If I would have stayed working at a mental health treatment center, I don't think that would have been possible. Um, but being in private practice does allow that for me. But again, I, I, I want people to understand that there's a lot more that goes into this process than just the thought of we want to be parents and I want to have a baby and I want to transfer two embryos. Like There's more to think about. And I think I say this every time I see you guys, you're amazing. I think oh. what you do, what you bring, just the way that you interact with the people that I see you interacting with, you bring that humanity back into what can sometimes feel like just a process. And 
getting people to understand the steps in the process and how it works. You're amazing. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I, I feel the same way about you with all the work that you do and how you help people. I, I just, at, at the end of the day, we're all humans and we all have feelings and I, I want to treat you as that, as a human being. And I want to be there to support you as much as I can, because a lot of times I only meet with them one time for just an educational consultation, unless they come back for a support session or something like that. But I, I want to to feel like you're seen and I want to feel that you are heard and validated in your experience. And I want to make sure again, that you have the information necessary to be able to make decisions about some things that are so complicated with this process. Yeah. So you touch on something very important there. It's, it's just a one-off session or can it be more if people need that support? How does that work? Yes, it, it can be more. Normally we meet with intended parents for a one-time psychoeducational consultation and, and, and they're, then they have their information and, they're, and then they're off. And then they go back to their fertility clinics or surrogacy agencies and they have the information to make decisions about their process. However, we offer to agencies, fertility clinics, and just the people that we work with, we offer them the ability to come back for support sessions. If you need support navigating difficult decisions, and then we are there and, and we would be able to, to help you. We can set up appointments to meet, to be able to talk about what your experience is and understanding what that is and highlighting some things that would be important for them to look at that maybe it's not very clear for them. and so. We, we do offer support sessions. We are amazing. I think on that, Joey, I'm going to love you and leave you. But again, you are inspirational. You motivate me every time I talk to you to do more, to do, be better, to become more empathetic. I think you are probably one of the nicest people I know. Thank you so much for, for doing this. Give my love to Rob and the girls. Um, and I hope to get to see you soon in person. Thank Will you. do. Thank you for having me on. It is a pleasure to speak with you always. Lots of love to you and your family as well. And thank you for all the work that you do and all the awareness that you bring around family building, third party reproduction, surrogacy. It's amazing what you do. So kudos to you as well.